My friend, if you're here this morning you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then I can't tell you that one day you'll be in heaven. The Bible says, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He sent Jesus Christ. It goes on to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything that we do ought to revolve around Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about just First Baptist Church and, and this great place to be, and I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad to be here this morning. I am surprisingly awake for a daylight savings morning. My eyes popped open at the new time of 6, 12 a.m., and I've been awake ever since. That means come 6, 12 tonight, during the evening service, I will pass out on the stage and not be able to preach. But until that point, we're going to have a great time because I'm wired up and, and raring to go here this morning. But everything we do ought to evolve around, revolve around Jesus Christ. Our theme this year is rooted in him. And without Jesus Christ, we don't have anything. Well, we think, well, these two hands have, have helped me in my business, and, and this great mind has, has enabled me to make some sound decisions. But without Jesus Christ, we are nothing. The Bible says that by him, that is Jesus Christ, all things consist. They're held together by Jesus Christ. Every single breath that I take, every breath that you take is a gift from God. And the Bible says by putting our simple faith in Jesus. He promises not only to forgive our sins, but he promises the companionship of the Holy Spirit through this life, and he promises life with him forever and ever in the next life. And this morning, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture of an individual who was lost, who did not have the hope of heaven, who was not a very nice individual, his name was Levi. We've been reading as a church through the book of Matthew this month. If you've not been able to receive one of these books rooted in the word in this month, the gospel of Matthew, I'd encourage you to pick one up at the end of the service. They're not on the back table. Something else is. But we'll get you one. And every day in this month, we're reading a portion of Scripture from the book of Matthew. And then this particular month, I am preaching through some passages of Scripture that we have read this, that previous week. And this morning, I want to speak to us about the call of Levi, also known as Matthew. The question I have this morning that I want you to walk away with, the question is, what is your story? What's your story? Everyone has a story. Your story may be boring. And thank the Lord for boring stories. Now, some of us want the exciting stories. I was saved as the plane was going down. But thank the Lord for boring stories. But everyone has a story. Some stories have a background that would make us cringe and shudder. Some of us have a background of story that would make us hurt. Maybe even cry and sob for your sake when you explain the hurt that you've been through and the grief that you've traveled in this life. But everybody has a story. Well, what's your story? Because here's the truth. God wants to write your story. Our kids were small. They would ask for bedtime stories. Apparently, I'm not a half-bad storyteller, at least in three- and one-year-old minds. I'm a hero. And I would lay there in bed, and I would tell these stories. Often, they would ask me to tell them a scary story. I don't know why, kids. They don't like to be scared, but at the same time, they want to be scared. And I would do these things. I remember one time, I'm laying in bed with, with James and Johnny. They're really young, and... And I said, you know, this, this monster is coming down the hallway, and I used my fingernails on the wall, or they didn't even know I was doing that. And they're like, oh, no. And then, you know, and then Doreen's like, honey, the kids won't be able to sleep tonight. And I'm laughing as a dad. And, you know, and, 
And even after the experience, the kids, like the next, like, Dad, tell us the same story again. Like, like you can scare them twice. We like stories. That's why books are popular. We like stories. That's why movies are, are popular and make money, because people like stories. There are good stories. There are, there are bad stories. On a side note, some of you like to tell your stories like that we call them dreams. That you dream at night. Those aren't stories, right? Those are better left inside your head. If you know me, if you're not, if you're, if you're visiting here or, or new here, understand this. I don't like to hear people's dreams. I just don't like it. This is what happens in people's dreams. They, they start to tell you their, their dream, and, and they're laughing because it's hilarious. But it never translates the same way. They're like, oh, this is the funniest part. You stand there like, oh, wow, that's, that's hilarious. And uh, Haha, I bet it was funny when you were dreaming. Or they, they tell you why they're mad at you from their dream. Or it's not reality. So if you have an amazing dream, share it with someone else. I'm talking about stories this morning. But everybody has a story. Most people like to, to hear stories. And here we're going to read about a story about a man who was called by God. And from his call from God, I believe that we can learn some valuable truths some life-changing lessons that I believe if we follow what Matthew did and understand what God asked of him, that it will be a help and a blessing in our life. Matthew did not have the Apostle Paul-like experience. Paul was warring actively against Christians, and to the Apostle Paul, God spoke to audibly on a road to Damascus. Levi didn't have this same experience. Sometimes we want someone else's story. Well, if I had their story, then I could be. Then I would be. And we think that our story has hindered us, disqualified us. And what we've allowed to do is let our story discourage us. Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 9 this morning. Matthew chapter 9. We'll begin looking in verse number 9 of Matthew chapter 9. In verse 9 of Matthew 9, the Bible reads, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his, unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's go, Lord, in prayer this morning. Lord, I'd ask that in the next few moments that your truth from your word would be clear for us. Lord, you know the specific needs here and online this morning. And you know exactly how to meet those needs. Lord, you know how to touch us and change us. And Lord, I pray that today, the truth from the word of God would be clear and powerful. Lord, I pray that you would help us. You would do something eternal this morning. Lord, encourage, save. Lord, we sure love you. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Here in Matthew chapter 9, we have one call of one disciple. A disciple by the name of Matthew. There were 12 disciples. If you're familiar with the disciples, you will know that of the 12, there was one, Judas Iscariot, that ended up uh, deceiving and then betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. Or deceiving the others and betraying Jesus Christ. Matthew was not raised in a Christian home. He was a Jew. 
More than that, he had a job that we read in this passage. The Bible says that God called him when he sat at the receipt of custom. Meaning that Matthew was a tax collector. Tax collectors during that time were known for a few things. They were known to be frauds. This was a well-known, established fact that the tax collectors who sat at the receipt of customs were frauds. Two, they were known as thieves. Now, I don't know if Matthew himself was a thief and a fraud, but this was a well-known, documented understanding of these tax collectors. I mean, beyond, beyond dispute, that, that people who had these jobs overall, we're talking about not just uh, from Bible writings, but from writings during that time, no one, it seemed that no one liked tax collectors. And little has changed throughout the thousands of years. All right, now I'm not saying all current tax collectors are frauds and thieves. All right, but the disdain holds true a little bit, does it not? And if you work for the IRS this morning, you can still be my friend. All right, you don't make the laws. What happened in Bible times, though, is they would make the laws a little bit. Well, they wouldn't make the law, but they would have to, uh, they'd have to exact and enforce the law. And what I'm told is how they'd make their money is the law may call for a $5 tax. They didn't use dollars, but just help me here with the illustration. And instead of charging $5, they charge $7 to the Flanders because they like the Flanders. And they charge $100 to the Goldsworthies. And of course, and of course, you can see how very quickly people would not like the tax collectors. Well, why'd you charge them seven and me a hundred? Well, that's, that's what it is. If not, you're going to be arrested and cast in a debtor's prison. You have to pay the tax. So here Matthew is sitting at this table, and you know that when people walk past, they would look with disdain at, at these people. Oh my goodness, look at that. You see that chariot, chariot he's driving? I paid for that chariot. You see that fig tree in his backyard? I paid for the gardener to, to, to help with that fig tree. You see that, that new thatch roof? The thatch roof 1,000? That was from my tax dollars. The Matthews house. Oh my goodness. The disdain there. Understand that Jesus Christ walked past and he said, follow me. There's a valuable truth that I don't want you to miss. And here's the truth. It wasn't where he was at. It was where he needed to be. And now understand this. Jesus did not come up and say, Matthew, what's your pedigree? Matthew, have you been perfect your whole life? Matthew, have you been honest in your dealings with people? Matthew, have you lived in a, a life of integrity and character? Because Matthew would have to say, no, 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 no. It wasn't where he was at. It was where God wanted him to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And in your life and in my life, we can look back and we can hear the words of discouragement. Well, you can't be used by God. Look what you have done. You aren't good enough to be in the service of God because look of the decisions that you have made. Look at the choices you still make. Look at the appetites that you have. Look at the struggles that you face. Look at your pedigree. Look at your job. Everything shouts, you can't be used by God. But listen, it wasn't where he was at. It was where he needed to be. He needed to follow God. He needed to write a book in the Bible. He's the one that wrote the book of Matthew. He needed to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He needed to change his crowd. It wasn't where he was at. It's where he needed to be. I love reading in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we call it the hall of faith. Many Bible characters are mentioned in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. To name a few, you'll come across in verse number 7, Noah, who's also recorded as a drunkard. Jacob, a liar and deceiver. Moses, a murderer. It says in verse uh, 31, by faith the harlot Rahab, she was a prostitute. In verse 32, in this hall of faith, 
and these men and women who are, who are touted as heroes of faith. You have, can I tell you, of Gideon, an idolater, Barak, a coward, Samson, a womanizer, David, an adulterer and murderer, and Samuel, a terrible father who raised two wicked sons. And yet, they are not defined by that. They're defined by their faith in God. And I'm so glad, I'm so glad that with our faith in God, that can define us, not our past. Because maybe your past isn't very good. Maybe if you're honest, if God came and said, what's in your past? You'd have to say, no, no, no. But this wasn't a job interview. Jesus didn't ask for a resume, did he? He didn't say, look, I'm looking for some disciples. I'll take applications on Monday and Tuesday from 9 till 12. If you're interested, please provide a resume, a couple of references, and a picture. This wasn't a job application. Can you imagine that? Hello, okay, we have Matthew. He's a tax collector. His references are other tax collectors. And no one else will give a character reference. Best attributes. Stealing money. Avoids the Pharisees and hangs out with other sinners. Can you imagine this? You know what, what a lot of people would say then? You know, Matthew, we're just going to file you over here. Come on now, right? But it didn't matter. It wasn't where he was at. It was where he needed to be. Listen, don't allow, don't allow that thought to come in. Listen, I'm not good enough. I've made too many mistakes. My past is too sordid. It's too troubled. You don't understand how much of a lack of character I have. Jesus Christ put all that aside and gave this simple request. Matthew, follow me. Number one, it wasn't where he was at. It was where God wanted him to be. But number two, understand this. It wasn't an argument, a sales pitch, or persuasion. Just a simple request. Jesus didn't show up. And Jesus did not say, well, I'll give you three reasons why you should follow me. Well, I've got this great opportunity for you. You are going to be famous. So famous that they will kill you. You are going to be poor. You're going to be poor. Disciples, they were, they were tortured. Or they were thrown in prison over and over. And they were ult- ultimately, they were all killed. Right? Jesus did not have a really good sales pitch right here. Four reasons to follow me. Three benefits of following Jesus. No, it wasn't an argument. You know what I find? That, that Jesus doesn't usually argue. When he talks to people, he normally just asks and requests. We argue with him. We argue with him. He restates his statement. Things like, well, when he says like, oh, be ye kind one to another. Right? And he, and he wants us to be kind to those around us. We argue with him. Well, well Lord, you don't understand you know, what a jerk that person is. If you knew them like I knew them, you wouldn't be kind either. That's what our minds, that's how we argue with the Lord. Like the Lord can't see them for who they are. Like the Lord doesn't know how some people will not treat us correctly. Often we are the ones, we are the ones who argue with the God or with God. You see, Jesus did not say, listen, you're gonna have a great opportunity, you're gonna have a great persecution. He just said, Matthew, follow me. Jesus did not say, Matthew, you won't have to worry about anything else. He just said, follow me. I love, I love that verse in Psalm where it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is a man that trusteth in him. And my friend this morning, I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know your story. I do know where God wants you to be, and that is following him. And I can promise you this, that if you follow Jesus Christ, you will find out 
that he is good. I tell you that because, first of all, the Bible tells me that. That my God is a good God. And my Bible is truth, is truth from cover to cover. The Bible says he's good. He's full of compassion. He's full of forgiveness. And he's full of mercy and kindness. My God is good. And I tell you that he is good. And you will find that out because the Bible says it. Then the Bible is true. And if you follow him, you'll find out just how good he is. You'll ask the question, will he forgive this? Yes, he will. Because he says he will. He's a good God. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Because the Bible says that. And I can promise you, on the authority of Scripture, if you follow him, you will find out just how good he is. But not only can I tell you based on the authority of Scripture, I can tell you from my own life. God is good. He's much better than I deserve. He answers prayer. He meets needs. He's patient. Man, aren't you glad God is patient? Man, I know in my life there's times the Lord's, you know, teaching me maybe about faith. And, and I'm like, I thought I learned this a long time ago. But I haven't yet. And the Lord's helping me learn it again. And he's patient. He knows just how to, how, how to, to work in a life so it's not too much. So I'm not overwhelmed. He knows how to encourage Listen, I can tell you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, there are times that God has encouraged me in a way that only God can. I could tell you the stories, but you'd hear the stories and you'd be like, well, that doesn't mean anything. And to you, it wouldn't. Because at that moment, God wasn't trying to encourage you. He was encouraging my heart. And he showed me a token. And it reminded me that my God loves me and he cares about me. And I promise you, if you follow God, he loves you and he'll care about you. He will meet your needs and he will touch you exactly like you need to be touched. God is good. But all Jesus said to Matthew was, if I can, hey, follow me. He didn't say, boy, listen, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew found that out afterwards. He didn't say that, I'll give you this power. I'll give you the Holy Spirit. Matthew found that out afterwards. He just said, Matthew, follow me. It wasn't an argument. It wasn't persuasion. It was just a simple request. I wonder, throughout the Gospels, Jesus often made a call for those to follow him. Now, this was a very specific call to one of his disciples. But throughout the, past, throughout the Gospels, Jesus would call to the crowds. And, and many, many people turned away from Jesus. In fact, I was reading this past, this past week. About the time that Jesus cast the demons out of the man, the maniac of Gadara. Right? He, would, he would be in the cemetery area. He, he typically wouldn't have any clothes on. Everyone was afraid of him. All right, and Jesus went and cast out the demons from him and he put them in, in some pigs and they, and they jumped off the cliff. By the end of that account, if you were to read that account, you'd find out that when Jesus comes back there and, and the boat pulls up, that everyone from the city, from the town, comes out to Jesus. It says everyone comes out there. And they beg him to leave. The whole town showed up. They said, Jesus, please, please go away. I read that this past week and it really struck my heart. Because Jesus Christ did just what they asked. He went away. I'm sitting there in my chair with my Bible open, thinking about this, this story, what happened. And then some thoughts started hitting my head. I wonder how many people in that town got sick later on and never got to see the power of Jesus Christ. I wonder how many lepers were in that town and never got to have their leprosy cleansed. I wonder how many blind people were there in that town who stayed blind till they died because Jesus Christ wasn't there to heal them. I wonder how many children or perhaps were demon possessed and, and were not touched because they asked Jesus to leave. Listen, when Jesus came to Matthew, he gave a simple request. And Matthew could have said, thank you, but no thank you. And Jesus Christ would have went on his way. 
You see, it didn't matter where he was at. It was where he needed to be. Number two, it wasn't an argument, a sales pitch, or persuasion, just a simple request. But number three, and lastly this morning, and please, please don't miss this from Scripture. Matthew didn't know all the answers. He didn't know how it would end up. He just responded. Would you look back in your scripture, please, and just don't miss this. If you, if you underline your Bible, I encourage you to underline it. If you highlight, if you don't, that's all right. But, but it, it, don't miss this. Verse number 9, Matthew chapter 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, follow me. There's a period there. And this is the next statement. And he arose and followed him. I love that. I love that. What did Matthew do? <laughs> it's like, picture it this way. He's sitting there, right? Jesus says, Matthew, follow me. And I don't see in Matthew's life any delay. I see him look at Jesus. This is what I see. Sit down. Push out the chair. Walk around the table. And started following Jesus. That money he was just collecting stayed right there. He arose and followed Jesus. This job that he had stayed right there. He didn't say, okay, Lord, um, give me a minute. i got to clean some things up. Lord, I'll, I'll follow you tomorrow. Can you swing back through about 11 o'clock? I'll be available then. Lord, can we talk about this? Can I negotiate something here? I've got some good ideas that, that you can really revolutionize your ministry. It was none of that. He arose, stepped down, followed him. You know where they went next? His house. That, that's the next couple, few verses I read. They went to his house and they began to eat and, and Matthew invited his friends there. The Bible calls them other publicans and sinners. All oh, nefarious group of people, according to the Pharisees. Pharisees were not happy with this. How could Jesus eat with these obviously pagan people? And Jesus said, I didn't come to heal the healthy, them that are whole. I came to heal those who are sick. What the Pharisees didn't realize but what you and I must realize, all of us are sick. We've been touched by sin. The old man, the fleshly man, the natural man, the Bible calls it, with all its dirty attitudes, desires, vile. And Jesus said, I've come to call them to repentance. Matthew, he didn't know all the answers. It's probably a good thing Jesus didn't tell him everything. So I'm not sure Matthew would have followed him. Imagine Matthew sitting at the table and Jesus said, Matthew, follow me. You're going to be a martyr. Hmm. Okay, great. Have a nice day, Lord. It's probably a good thing the Lord doesn't tell us everything up front. But I'll tell you, I guarantee, I guarantee this. All right, I guarantee this, that Matthew did not regret following Jesus. If Matthew could come down from heaven today and stand before us, I know what he would say. He would say, listen, follow Jesus. Leave where you're at and follow Jesus. I know he would say, it doesn't matter what your story is. Let Jesus write you a new story. He'd say, listen, I was a publican. I was despised. I was a sinner. And Jesus came. I followed him. And I wouldn't trade my life for anything. He'd probably say, well, I didn't make as much money following Jesus as I did stealing it from people. But he said, my life, infinitely better. His name was Andrew. His story, he came from humble beginnings. He had parents, and they provided him with every opportunity to succeed. He was a sports star. Played games in the yard and Became quite good at football. 
Ninth grade, was a running back, the starting running back. And by his junior year, he was the star of the football team. As his high school popularity grew, so did his fame around the campus, and the student body voted him under the homecoming court all four years. Success at home, success on the football field, success in the classroom, and he said success with the ladies. He said I was drawn to the party scene. It's a popular kid, and popular kids go to parties. It was in high school that I learned to drink beer and try drugs. It was in high school. I experimented with immorality and with my girlfriend and then cheated on her as well. He said, I was lost. Andrew said, I was lost and didn't even realize how lost I was. Scholarship and football. And so he went to a large university. University of Illinois. He came with the ambition to play some football and become a doctor. But he said it wasn't long before the social scene took over. And I was partying with my fraternity, meeting girls, blowing off classes to hang out at bars and parties. Grades drastically affected. A decent semester followed by a poor one. Began to affect me, he said, and problems were getting worse and worse before they got any better. And I started fighting in bars to release my anger and discontentment. I was aware I had problems, but my life was so empty. I had no one to pray through, and I thought no hope. After graduating from college, his story, I started getting my life together, but it took a DUI in an arrest for fighting and wrecking my car while under the influence. But in 2012, I landed at a company that I loved. It was at this place I saw myself spending the rest of my career. I thought, I'm going to climb the corporate ladder. I had aspirations to become the company's top sales associate. At this company, though, Christianity was alive throughout the organization. I developed some relationships with people who placed God at the center of everything they did. The people were incredible, they were fun, confident, made me laugh. But it wasn't enough to get me in church. Andrew says I was crushing it at work. The first year I hit all the points and I won the highly coveted rookie of the year. I was so happy that night, overwhelmed that night. I celebrated with my colleagues being the drink again. Because of that award, I won a trip to Florence, Italy. And of course, I celebrated in Italy and got so drunk, he says, that I fell into and broke a $3,000 statue. Still, wasn't enough. A few months after that, it was in a, after a meeting with the entire sales team. On the way home, I was in a cab with a couple of teammates, sales associates, and me talking with our Afghani cab driver. I was asking him questions about his home country, and he was happy to talk about it. He said we were drunk, and one of my buddies made an offhand remark to the cab driver. The cab driver pulled the cab over yelling at us and reached into his pocket. I thought it was a gun. So I began to attack him. But it wasn't. It was just a cell phone. At this point, it was too late. Members of my company knew about it. By the next morning, I was fired. Charges, life is over. I had no other place to turn. So I went to church. I went to church. He said, I went to a church that my mom was attending regularly. Had asked me over and over. It was at that church, Andrew says, 
that I let God in. It was at that church I opened my heart and I accepted Jesus Christ. He finishes his testimony this way. I know that I've been put here on this earth by God. And God will help me discover his purpose for me. My friends, it doesn't matter where you're at. It's where you need to be. It's not going to be a sales pitch, an argument, or persuasion, but a simple request. Follow me. And Jesus will not give you all the answers. He won't tell you everything about it. He just wants you to simply follow. What's your story? Maybe good, maybe bad. You see, in this account, we had some Pharisees who thought they had a good story, but it wasn't as good as they thought it was. It doesn't matter what your story is, Jesus Christ wants to write your story. My friends, the greatest thing, action that we can do is follow Jesus Christ. Not only in salvation, but in discipleship afterwards.